um, as you may know that this topic is rather new for our commission and we are really very pleased to have the component of culture in our um, in our activities, especially considering that is a, a very important a component of the impl success implement a successful implementation of the ecosystem approach. So we have to learn quite a lot from culture in the past, but also um, we need to use or to consider culture for for the future. So this is uh, something that. Uh, it was great to have Pam leading this group. She is extremely active with all these um, initiatives uh, and her work with the IPBS and the commission is, is, is quite important. And we are always very thankful to her for accepting and for having such a lead to, to this group that I know it, it's not easy because it's something new for us and for the commission. But I'm sure that all her contributions and we are very interested in, in having this session uh, with this presentation um, where we are with this uh, publication and the future work of, of the group of cultural practices that, that, as you know, is one of the key priority areas of, of the commission. So I don't want to take your time. So please, Pam, go ahead and very much, very welcome all of you to, to this session. Great, thank you so much, Angela. Let me quickly share my screen so I can introduce everybody. Um, so welcome to this webinar on um, cultural ecosystem services. Um, and we're especially happy to be able to um, introduce the panelists, which I'll get to in just one minute. Um, but let me say a little bit about why we're doing this. Um, and we have over the past year and a half now, I guess, um, put together a special issue for ecology and society on um, challenges to understanding and managing cultural ecosystem services in the global south. Um, and so this is a screenshot of what the special issue looks like. Five papers are, are completely finished and up there now. Um, and three more are in copy <laughs> editing stages. So there will be eight um, papers total for this special issue. And this was something that um, we knew that we wanted to do in the cultural practices and ecosystem management um, thematic group for the last couple of years. So we issued a call for papers. We got quite a bit of interest. We selected um, the papers that we felt fit best together. And we were particularly interested in a couple of key themes. Um, one was use of creative methods. What methods can we use to understand cultural ecosystem services? Um, and a second theme was where are all the different places that cultural ecosystem services can contribute to either better understanding of ecosystem management or help us understand the barriers um, where there are problems um, to ecosystem management. So I think you'll see in our presentations today that we achieved both of those goals. We have some really interesting papers talking about creative methods. And then we have case studies spanning a variety of ecosystems uh, around the world. So we're really pleased with the special issue and, and a particular thanks to Sim and Angela for financial support. It's totally open access. Um, all those papers are available. Um, also a thanks to the institutions of several of our authors who also contributed. Um, and a big thanks to Rutgers University who contributed to two papers. Um, so let me quickly introduce our panelists today. Um, and then each panelist is gonna speak for about eight to 10 minutes and then we'll have questions um, at the end. Please feel free to, along the way, type some questions into the chat or the Q and A. Um, and if you have a particular author that you're interested in, in having respond, um, please do that. Please indicate who you'd like to ask the question to. Um, so our first speaker will be Professor, Professor Jun He, who is an environmental social scientist and he has a specialization in human ecology. He's at the School of Ethnology and Sociology at Yunnan University in China. His research interests lie in global value chains, indigenous knowledge, non-timber forest products, agroforestry, and forest governance. Then our next speaker will be Dr. Rumana Sultana, who is an assistant professor with the Center for Sustainable Development at the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. She works on issues ranging from marine ecosystems 
to disaster management, to urban development. Dr. Karen Allen is the Henry Keith and Ellen Hard Towns Assistant Professor of Sustainability, Sustainability Science at Furman University. She holds a PhD in anthropology and integrative conservation from the University of Georgia. Her research focuses on the impact of policy and cultural values on human decision-making and socio-ecological landscapes. Then we'll have Chelsea Hunter, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at The Ohio State University. Her research focuses on collaborative coral reef conservation projects in the South Pacific. And finally, we'll have Dr. Teresa Selfa, who is Professor and Chair of Environmental Studies at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. She works on social dimensions of science and technology, agri-food systems, and public participation in environmental policy, among her other interests. Um, so welcome to all of the panelists. I'm gonna stop screen sharing and I will turn it over um, to Professor Junhei as our first speaker. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see, I'm going to share my uh, screen. Yes. Okay, can you see the screen? Yep. Yep, okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's my pleasure to be part of uh, this special issue. And uh, also uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really exciting. And we, we get this uh, variety of uh, participants for, 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 for this meeting. And uh, probably in US you are in the morning and uh, here we are almost uh, going to the middle of the night. But, uh, I, I, I still very fresh to, to present what I, uh, my, my work and, uh, and want to share with you about my uh, research here. So uh, this, this, uh, my presentation today come from the paper which uh, published in Ecology and Society as a special issue. The title is uh, Culture and the Parks, Intercropping uh, Cultural Ecosystem Services in Conservation in the Tibetan Region of Southwest China. So it's a, it's a kind of a case study for, uh, uh, in, in, in China. Okay, so uh, some background about the uh, situation here. Uh, here you can see in China, now we have a very dramatically increase of a protected area. Uh, uh, from the figure here, you can see about the, uh, this is the uh, 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 nature reserve. It's also uh, part of the protected area. And uh, you can see the area increased and also the number increased dramatically. So the China put a lot of efforts for the conservation. And you uh, probably, you just know, just in the uh, October in Kunming, my city here, we, we just hold the biodiversity uh, con Congress, the uh, COP COP 15. So there were a lot of efforts for for the uh, uh, protected area expanding in, in China, and for this uh, this kind of expanding of a protected area, and there were two kind of debate about the role of the culture in protected area in the national park. One kind of uh, argument is that the, the national park and the protected area is very good. It's good for the recreation. It's good for the cultural needs of the people who can go there as a tourist and to enjoy the environment. But on, on the other side, there were also the criticize about the cultural dimension, about the protected area. That's the thing, culture can be obstacle for the, for the, uh, for the protected area building because uh, like, uh, in China, a lot of local people, indigenous people, are living in the uh, protected area. They can be a lot of conflict when we build the, uh, uh, the, the national park. So the very question is, uh, what is the meaning of uh, cultural ecosystem services from the local perspective? And uh, it's a re what is its a relation with the uh, protected area building? Because right now we have uh, quite a lot of uh, expanding of the protected area. So. In this research, we try to understand the local perspective of cultural ecosystem services in the context of the uh, national park building. 
So the research sites, uh, probably uh, 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 some, many of you do not know where the Yunnan province is located. Actually, we are part of the global uh, biodiversity hotspots. Uh, we, are, we are quite rich in the biodiversity, also in the cultural diversity. So we are in the south, southwest of the China, and uh, our research in the Shangri-La County is in the uh, northwest of the Yunnan. And this is our research area, the, the Pudato National Parks. And the parks actually is the first national park in China, which built in 2007. Before that, we don't have a national, this term, national park. What we have is a natural reserve. Natural reserve is a, is a kind of a restrict uh, kind of a conservation area. No people can be involved, no, uh, uh, no people can stay in and uh, no uh, ecotourism can, can develop. So it, uh, start from 2007, we have the first national park. This is the Putato natural, National Park, which is our research site. And for build this national park is the support by the TNC, the Nature Conservancy and the Chinese government, which they try to achieve the win-win goal that is for conservation and the development. And as you can see, within this national park, there was still a lot of uh, settlement, the, uh, the red one, the settlement in this national park. People, there were no relocation program carried out. And the people has quite some of involvement and participation in this national park uh, kind of management. And also there were uh, the, the payment for the local people once the national park are built up because when, when, when the national park is built and they open for the tourist development. So they, they use the tourist kind of uh, uh, revenue uh, to give the payment, the compensation to the local uh, community there. But our research look at the issue about the culture. So the first result when we go inside the national park, we, we can find that there's a very kind of a cultural kind of a practice are happened still in this national park. Even when, when the national park is built, the people can still pra practice their, oh, sorry, practice their uh, agri-pastoralism. You can see the Tibetan people, they raise their yak here and they, they, they grow their uh, potato and they, they grow their, uh, uh, their barley all kind of agricultural practice still can ha happen. So when we ask the people, the people said, you know, within this park, we, we, we have a wooden house and we have our own yaks and we practice our traditions. This allow, and also the park even allow us to, to cut some trees when we need to rebuild our, our, our house. And, and, uh, and uh, it, it's still common for people to raise several or eight car, uh, yaks per, per household. And also they, they have enough of these yaks in this place. And the people also express that they continue their kind of a traditional cultural practice for the agro-pastoralism. So it's, a, it's a, like a, the intercrop, uh, inter, uh, intercropped the, the, uh, the, the, the people's practice when the park are, are built. It. People are still doing what they, they can do in, in, in the park. And also we found out the people in this national park still can practice the manager their multifunctionality of the forest. People can cut their, their uh, field wood and the people are collecting their uh, masataki mushroom, which are exported to Japan. They, they end a lot of uh, the uh, uh, money from this uh, uh, mushroom selling. And importantly, for the Tibetan people, there were holy mountain in the national park. And the people in Holy Mountain, they still can burn, they still can practice all what they can have. And it's interesting that in this national park, once it's built, people's cultural practice for, the, for, for this Holy Mountain, for their, their, their forest management still can continue. And we, we're really interested in this kind of uh, 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 practice. And also in this national park, we found that the, the people together with the uh, uh, forest, uh, with the park authority are conserving the sacred uh, uh, waterscape. And for the Tibetan people, they are, they are unique. 
when people died, they, they use the water as a, to have a kind of a burning side for their funeral. It's they, they do not burn the body. And some of them, they cut the body and put it in the, in the water. So when the park is built, the, the, the national park, they, they, they try to avoid to affect the people's uh, uh, burial sites. So you can you can see the the quote from the 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 uh, the, the villager we interviewed here. They can see their cultural practice are continually, and this practice actually continually contribute to the conservation as well as for the ecotourism development because people also enjoy the Tibetan culture when they go inside this uh, this park. So some brief conclusion is that when we're talking about eco, uh, uh, cultural ecosystem services, we do not see it as a kind of ob object. We, we need to see it's really like a local cultural practice associated with the environment. If we need to understand the really culture people are practice, which embedded in the people's local everyday life, people's everyday life for the agri-pastoralism, uh, agri for everyday life in their uh, uh, forest management, and also their everyday life within the water, sacred water. That is their cultural practice interact with the environment. And, uh, and also from this case study, we found out that the inclusiveness in the conservation do contribute to environment and the economics particularly contribute to the cultural conservation. And as you see from this place, when the national park are built, there were no relocation program carry out. And for this national park, the people, uh, the, after they build the national park, they still allow the people to practice their traditional kind of agriculture, forest management, and their sacred forest kind of practice. That's enough, that's good. That is really good for the environmental conservation and the cultural protection. That is good really for the local people's economic development as people are continually can pick up the, the mushroom to selling and the people get the compensation from the government uh, after the national park are built. And therefore, we need to call for the non-material benefit from ecosystem services. Is especially we need to go beyond the from traditional uh, previously understanding about a focus on the recreational value, monetary cultivation, uh, cal calculation about the cultural ecosystem services. What we need to turn it back to the people's culture, especially from the local perspective, to understand their cultural practice, how this interact, local cultural practice are interact with the environment, especially for those indigenous people like Tibetan people in, in China. So this is the case I want to show you about how culture, uh, cultural ecosystem services are practiced and conserved interact with the national park in China. So uh, I think my my presentation just end here. And if you are interested about the more detail, you can find the paper, which is already published online on the on the journal. And uh, and thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, and a, and a special thank you um, to Junhei, who also served as special issue editor, and so helped us um, select reviewers and so forth. And Mina Su, who's also on our call and is co lead. Um, at cultural ecosystem, uh, cultural practice and ecosystem services also served as a guest editor. So thank you to both of them for really helping shape this special issue. So now I'd like to turn to Dr. Rumana Sultana. Um, please share your screen if you'd like, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay, I, I think you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, and uh, thank you for having me today. And I'd like to convey my thanks to the editor, especially Pamela and other editors for making this issue published. And thank you so much. And good evening and morning to everyone from wherever you are from. So I'm Rumana Sultana and today I will be talking about our research on urban ecosystem service, urban cultural ecosystem services. And as uh, Dr. Pamela mentioned, I work as an assistant professor at the Center for Sustainable Development, University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. 
So this is also a part of the spatial issue as already uh, Dr. June talked about. So I'm not uh, going to talk about that issue, but if you're interested, you can see the detail here. So in Dhaka city, we actually see the green spaces like urban parks, and there are community gardens, rooftop gardens, and street side greeneries. And in the urban ecosystems, we actually were looking for cultural ecosystem services that are the non-material benefits people actually experience from those spaces. So this includes recreation, social cohesion, and mental satisfaction or education and learning kind of things. So as we know that more than 50% of the population lives in urban settings, and this number is going to increase by all around 70% in 2050. Uh, although uh, the number is a bit lower in case of Bangladesh, so here around 40% of the respondents live in, live in urban areas. So previously it was very clearly uh, proved that green spaces are very important to improve the quality of urban development and also quality of urban planning. But yet in Bangladesh, uh, researches are very less concentrated on urban cultural ecosystem services. So when we were reviewing literature, we really have found very uh, less literature from Bangladesh. Mostly cultural ecosystem services researches were conducted in coastal areas or in mangrove forest, but we haven't yet explored much on urban green spaces here. And uh, some studies from around the world were concentrated on economic feasibility analysis or accessibility to the green space. So within this study, we actually aim to understand people's perception on CES and how their sociodemographic backgrounds influences on their perception. So three specific questions were attempted to answer within this study. And those questions were related to the importance of green space and how residents' characteristics were influencing their perception. And finally, how residents uh, perceive about the management of urban green space-based uh, cultural ecosystem services. So the study was conducted in Dhaka city and this city is divided into two parts. One, uh, the uh, upper one is Dhaka North City Corporation and the Southern one is South City Corporation. And in the South City is divided into 10 zones and we conducted this study in zone one. And this uh, zone is actually uh, quite uh, familiar for having urban green spaces like some renowned park, if I name those Aromna and Dhanmonti Lake Park. And also the residential areas are quite privileged with green space. So we thought if we uh, work on this area, we will get some genuine perception about how to manage those spaces. So 405 questionnaire surveys were conducted and to analyze the data, we applied some descriptive and inferential statistics. And among the respondents, 56% were male and there were high, quite, uh, the uh, age group data was a bit skewed towards young respondents and there were, 80% uh, um, of the respondents were educated. That means they get uh, formal schooling and 20% of them didn't get any source of formal schooling. So here we can see that uh, respondent perceived um, recreation as the most preferred cultural ecosystem services and then aesthetic sense of place and social cohesion. And surprisingly, they uh, really think cultural heritage is the least important CES for um, green spaces in Dhaka city. And then we try to explore the correlation between different kind of uh, cultural ecosystem services. And we have found that there were some strong correlation between natural awareness, religious and spiritual services and cultural heritage. So if uh, one green space can provide these three kinds of services, then that place will be very uh, appreciated by the uh, city dwellers. And also there were other 
other uh, set like aesthetics, mental satisfaction, and sense of place. But at the same time, there were some negative correlation too. And in Dhaka cities, uh, the, the things happen that uh, one green space usually provide recreational services at the same time it uh, tried to provide natural awareness kind of services. And that situation becomes problematic and the residents uh, feel it very um, um, disgusting or they were irritated with this kind of thing because some people's love calm and quiet environment and some does love the recreation and social connectedness kind of things. And then we also found that there were some influence of respondents background on their perception. So uh, female respondents actually uh, highly rated recreation and educational services. On the other hand, uh, the people who have never been to school really appreciate green space for recreational services and social cohesion. And we have seen that um, the respondents who usually visit green space daily, they prefer to use those spaces for recreation, education and learning, and especially social uh, activities kind of um, activities. On the other hand, people who used to be visit green space yearly or less, they prefer green spaces for mental satisfaction. And when we ask the respondents about how they perceive um, green space important in terms of providing CES, then they uh, um, replied rooftop gardens are the most important one to provide uh, ecosystem services, then green parks and gardens. And when we talk about the management with them and they opine that collaborative effort are really needed here, collaborative effort means uh, effort from individual being to community and also from government and non-government organization, also the international development organization. So they think that individual effort, um, which are actually at this moment is greatly taken to take the green space um, or uh, green space related, greening related initiative forward, but they think collaborative effort is really needed with the engagement of different public and private organization. And finally, we would suggest that policy and planning related to urban green space management should consider diverse perceptions of the residents. And especially they should create enough promises to deliver diverse ecosystem services, which are correlated, not negatively correlated. And plan planners also need to concentrate on uh, planning green spaces in the residential areas, which can provide recreational and so social activities kind of services and prioritization of roof rooftop garden by all the respondents also suggest the need of favorable policies like ta tax exemption uh, for uh, rooftop gardening development in the residential areas in the, in the urban regions. And also as respondent feel that government could play the most uh, crucial role, but the collaborative effort is very important. So uh, our policy can concentrate on that aspect. And finally, I'd like to say that CS is the comfortable way for the residents to actually relate green space to their life and it can motivate them to be the storage. So large scale studies are really needed, not only for Bangladesh, but also for other global South countries in terms of exploring CS in the urban green space and not only now, not should be limited to only exploring, but policy and urban planning and management strategies also should include uh, residents' reflection and their perception. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation, and, and I can be reached to the email address I wrote here. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ruman. I appreciate that very much. Um, so our next speaker um, will be Karen Allen, and we'll turn it over to you, Karen. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, okay. Hopefully everyone can see the screen here. Um, if not, please interrupt me. <laughs> 
Um, so hello, um, I'm going to- Karen, we don't, share... we don't see it yet. Oh, no. How about- Yeah, now, now it's coming up. Yep, got <laughs> okay. it. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to share uh, some of the engaged work that I have been doing with stakeholders in the Central Pacific region of Costa Rica around the issues of conservation facing their communities. Uh, this work occurred in Costa Rica as part of an engaged research grant through the Winter Grant Foundation, where the goal was actually to explore methodology. So I'm going to be looking more at methodologies here for communicating conservation goals for the region, while also supporting grassroots conservation efforts. Uh, in this vein, we compared two methodologies for exploring ecosystem services with stakeholders. We worked in two different regions, and both of these fall within the Bellbird Biological Corridor. And that's an initiative roughly around here um, that aims to connect habitat and support sustainable development across a mixed use landscape. So we actually have some protected areas in this region and also a lot of areas in production. Um, and one of these regions, Santa Rosa, is in a small agricultural town. Um, it's, in the, it's rural and it's in the mountains. It's about 250 people. And then the other is slightly larger, Costa de Pajaros, and that is a fishing village on the coast. So in particular, we wanted to understand the role of dialogue and stakeholder engagement and the extent to which inclusive processes resulted in the potential for better conservation outcomes. The idea behind dialogue is to fully open lines of communication. Uh, this quote from some of the founding scholars uh, says that if each one of us can give full attention to what is actually blocking communication, while he is also attending properly to the content that was communicated, then we may be able to create something new between us, something of very great significance for bringing to an end the at present insoluble problems of individual and society. So dialogue offers the potential to engage stakeholders on topics that are potentially contentious. Uh, conservation can be seen as one of these issues in our study region, as protected areas can remove land from production and farmers are occasionally displaced by conservation or subject to increased human wildlife conflict. Dialogue can open lines of communication so that participants share a common content. Scholars have posited that this dialogue can help to bridge people and solve seemingly intractable individual society conflict. So one of the methods that we employed is called photo voice. And this is a method that can stimulate dialogue. We presented participants with a series of three prompts listed here related to cultural ecosystem services values. Um, so those are when or where do you feel the most connected to the environment? What do you do in your daily life to help conserve the environment? And how has the environment changed in the last five years? We then provided participants with cameras and asked them to take pictures in response to the prompts. We worked with um, different groups in these regions, both with minors, as you can see here, working with these youth in their school uniforms. It's actually me in that picture. Um, and we also worked with adults. Uh, we met two days later and reviewed the, the pictures. Participants choose their favorite pictures that best capture the sentiments of the prompt, and then they share those with the group and there's a conversation surrounding those pictures. So that instigates a dialogue around the photographs and related environmental values. And from this, we have pictures with notes and also recorded um, audio. We also hosted workshops in each study region um, uh, based around the idea of model-based reasoning. So these workshops um, use a boundary object, which uh, can be used to discuss a common theme and stimulate dialogue around that theme. The idea of a boundary object is that the object helps participants to ground their mental models in something and arrive at a shared understanding of a topic. So in this case, we actually use maps as a boundary object um, through which participants discussed environmental challenges and solutions in each region. And they were encouraged to use post-it notes and mark up the maps and have conversations about challenges and solutions within the areas where they live, and then um, would share these uh, and then start a conversation as a larger group around these boundary objects. So here you can see some people sharing the map um, and then notes that we were taking uh, to kind of uh, come to a common understanding of some of the challenges and solutions. So I'm going to share a few of the results today, and I would be happy to take questions on this approach or any findings um, later in the Q&A. 
We uh, use these recorded transcripts, photographs, and notes from the photo voice sessions uh, to code responses in MaxQDA, so coding software, uh, for to each prompt. So here's an example, these pictures here, of what some common themes that were present, present in the photographs. And uh, what we did is we looked at how these actually map onto cultural ecosystems or ecosystem services categories from the millennial ecosystem assessment. So for example, in response to the prompt, when or where do you feel the most connected to the environment? Uh, one miner shared this picture and talked about connections to planting with their grandfather. We categorized this as familial and that maps nicely onto the cultural ecosystem, a cultural ecosystem service. And then we were able to uh, take those codes and actually do a little bit of a quantitative analysis to analyze the frequency of codes um, and compare across prompts. Uh, so for example, uh, in that prompt A of when or where do you feel the most connected to the environment, the ecosystem services um, were compared across both towns. So you can see the differences between Costa de Pajaros and Santa Rosa. Um, and one just trend that you can pick out here is that Santa Rosa perceives more of an economic and a tourism value to the environment than does Costa de Pajaros. The model-based reasoning workshops were more organic um, and they did not have those kinds of structured prompts. And so the data did also, also did not lend itself very well to mixed methods and the more sort of extractive um, quantitative analysis. Rather, the workshops provided space to engage with environmental concerns and a shared sense of stewardship, using those maps as a negotiating space. So this resulted in similar issues and topics arising. Um, and some of these are documented in photographs. So um, this is all written in Spanish, of course, but you can see um, you know, there's issues that are coming up that people are concerned about and able to share. Um, and then they did share these and discuss them in group, but they were definitely less quantifiable. Um, one thing that we did is we held an exit survey because we were trying to, we, we didn't unfortunately have the potential to continue these workshops in the zone um, as we would have liked to for a long period of time. So instead we tried to gauge the excitement and interest around these workshops um, and just asking some simple questions in an exit survey and coding those um, or with the responses from one to 10, one being, or 10 being the most positive response. So you can see here, people um, had very positive responses about the um, workshops and uh, wanted to participate in more workshops of this kind. And so we thought this differed a bit um, from our perception of the photo voice workshops, which, per which participants described as fun and engaging, but were less directly beneficial for residents. Um, here's just one nice quote from one of the participants of the model-based reasoning workshops about the kinds of action steps that also started to formulate. Um, and so this says, when we need, uh, we need to find a balance between production and conservation. We can't change the mentality of those who came before us, but we can change the current mindset and raise environmental awareness. So focus on um, raising the uh, environmental awareness of their town. Um, and uh, we did notice, however, on those works in the dialogue workshops that it was difficult to extract ecosystem services values. And we thought this perhaps seemed a little bit ironic because they seem to be the best method of engaging with stakeholders. So in conclusion, we feel that all of these methods um, and the, for promoting dialogue, both of them are really critical for conservation practice and continued stakeholder engagement, particularly around the idea of cultural ecosystem services. There are trade-offs in each, but both can offer a means for eliciting values, changing perceptions, and empowering local communities around potentially con contentious conservation issues. Um, my paper is also included in that special issue if you wanted to see more. Um, and just a quick thanks to the people who worked um, from Up Costa de Pajaro, Santa Rosa, and the Butler Biological Corridor who worked with me on this, as well as funding support from Wintergren Foundation and from a university. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Karen. So we will go from the forests of Costa Rica um, to the marine environments of the South Pacific and I'll turn it over to Chelsea Hunter. Okay, um, so thank you everybody for the opportunity to be here with you today. I'm thrilled to be presenting my paper. Unfortunately, my co-author Matthew Lowry can't be here. Also just wanna say thanks to him. Um, our paper is titled Ecosystem Services Research in Action, Reflexively Valuing Environments in the South Pacific. 
This research took place in Moray, French Polynesia. French Polynesia is located about halfway between Australia and South America and the South Pacific. It's adjacent to the island of Tahiti, which houses the country's main international airport and where tourism is an economic mainstay. Moria receives many tourists while also being a key site for coral reef research in the South Pacific. She houses two international research stations, one American and one French on the small 52 square kilometer island. Aside from being a popular site for tourism and research, Moria's lagoons that surround the island are also popular fisheries for the local population. Some people fish professionally, selling their fish on the island and others fish for subsistence. For the island's indigenous Tahitian population, eating fresh reef fish is nearly as important to Tahitian identity as speaking the Tahitian language. Our research took place in the summer of 2016. We used an embedded mixed methods design where we surrounded the contingent valuation portion of the survey between two qualitative questions asking respondents to share a story about their relationship to the lagoon. The contingent valuation portion of the survey identified 11 ecosystem services, seven of them were cultural. The ecosystem services were represented by photos, the name of the service was written on the front of the photo and descriptions of the services were written on the back. Participants were asked to rank the importance of the ecosystem services by distributing 100 points represented by small seashells across the photos. More points indicated more importance. Following the contingent valuation and qualitative question, we asked respondents three open-ended questions about the survey's ability to capture their thoughts, feelings, and or experiences in the lagoon. We also asked them if there are any services that were either missing or should be changed on the survey. Throughout the administration of the survey, we documented when respondents experienced confusion, puzzlement, or misgivings. We viewed these moments not as time to intervene and teach them a proper protocol, but as moments to render legible disjunctures between the ontological and conceptual commitments of the survey and ecosystem services framework and the interviewees. Rather than viewing the survey as a neutral tool, we remained attentive to how it could influence our research outcomes. We conducted this survey with 100 people on the island. They were from four profession groups. They included professional fishers, scientists, tourism operators, and other, which were individuals from the general population on the island who participated in a variety of livelihood strategies. We calculated average scores for each ecosystem service for each of the four groups. Habitat ranked the highest for the general population and scientist groups. Subsistence fishery was ranked highest by the professional fisher group for the general population and fisher groups. Economic gain was ranked as the second and second most important service. Education and cultural heritage were ranked as the first and second most important services by tourism operators. Although cultural heritage was ranked as sixth or seventh most important by all the other profession groups. Education was ranked in the top five services by all groups. Scientists' top four most important ecosystem services though were the supporting, regulating, and provisioning services. And the seven cultural values that we collected were measured below these more ecological categories. For all four groups, tourism and recreation were ranked in the lowest three categories. We also used Kruskal Wallace test with post hoc done test to analyze between which groups statistically significant differences existed. We found significant differences in the valuations of habitat between fishers and scientists, in recreation between the general population and scientists, in subsistence fishery between professional fishers and the general population, and between professional fishers and tourism operators, and in tourism between the general population and tourism operators. In general, respondents agreed that our survey was able to capture their thoughts, feelings, and experiences. One scientist noted that it covered the various usages of the environment and both the social and ecological components of the reef. However, there were other statements made by Tahitian respondents in particular that seemed to contrast the way that ecosystem services understands marine environments from how Tahitians understand their relation to marine environments. Many, Tahitians re many Tahitian respondents discussed throughout the survey the ocean and fish as agents as having moods and as living in reciprocal relationships with people. Scientists, on the other hand, contrasted their professional or scientific activities in the lagoon from their personal activities in the lagoon, as these were two different domains of relating to the lagoon for them. Half of them also suggested science as a missing category, as this was a specific mode of relating to the lagoon for them. We described three tensions that emerged in the process of administering the survey and analyzing our findings. The first is a distinction made by professional fishers who describe subsistence fishing as a positive activity and economic gain, which they gain through fisheries, as a degrading activity. 
The second tension is between how fishers and scientists value different services as evidenced in the photo elicitation results. And the third tension relates to the assumption within the photo elicitation method that the photos are a neutral and transparent method, which is contrasted with how respondents inter interpreted and interacted with photos. Beginning with the tension between fishing and, envi and environmental degradation, we noted that Tahitian participants, fishers or otherwise, would often describe the ocean of fish as agents living in reciprocal relationships with people and who must be respected in order to continue providing fish to people. Subsistence fishery and economic gain were ranked as professional fishers' top two ecosystem services. However, fishing solely by the motivation of economic gain was viewed as something that contributed to environmental degradation. In other words, fishing for economic gain violated the respectful and reciprocal relationship that a fisher must hold with the ocean in order for it to continue providing fish. The second tension we noticed were differences in scientists and fisher valuations. Scientists ranked habitat as their top ecosystem services along with the four non-cultural non ecosystem services included in the survey. Throughout the ecosystem services literature, there's a notion that differences in values may lead to conflicts or trade-offs in management priorities. There's a tendency to assess these differences in values according to demographic characteristics or other sociocultural attitudes. That's to say that differences in valuations are purely a reflection of cultural or psychological barriers or factors, sorry. We seek to challenge this notion, however, and suggest that these differences in valuations may reflect deeper incongruities between the ecosystem services framework and respondents' ontologies or ways of being in the world. By assuming that differences in valuations are cultural or psychological characteristics, the ecosystem services framework promotes an assumption that ecosystem services categories are immutable, pre-existing, and invariable, and therefore only renders legible specific ways of valuing environments and of being in the world. Moreover, ecosystem services categories are assumed to be distinct from values. Values can vary, but nature doesn't, and this idea reinforces nature culture dualism. While progress has been made in the ecosystem services literature through the development of the relational values framework, we argue that relational values stabilizes nature culture dualism rather than circumventing it. It shifts the focus from the ecosystem service category to the relationship between stakeholders and the ecosystem service category but it still fundamentally relies on nature cultural dualism and the assumption that ecosystem services exist in the world as immutable categories upon which humans assign contingent values. Our participants' experiences of the world, however, and of the ecosystem services method as described by all profession categories contradicted the notion of nature cultural dualism as well as the immutability of ecosystem services categories. This quote by a scientist sums up this tension present within the framework. Because we humans always want to put a value to things, and in order to put values into very clear boxes, we create all of these different categories that in reality, while they are linked, while they are linked to what we experience, they are not exactly the same thing. The truth is that in reality, it is very hard to dissociate certain things. The third tension we noticed in the survey was the assumption that the photo elicitation research and survey techniques could provide a neutral conduit through which to access people's values and understandings of the world. We found that sometimes interviewees responded more to what was in the photo than the ecosystem service it was intended to represent, despite our instructions and guidance throughout the survey process. The photo method was unable to contain the values assigned to it and were deployed by interviewees in unexpected ways. We suggest, in accordance with other science and technology scholars, science and technology studies scholars, that this demonstrates that all research methods shape the findings they generate and when practiced without reflexivity, only render legible specific ways of ordering or understanding the world. In sum, we offer three lessons for resource managers. The first is that to bear in mind that research methods have effects. It's important to practice reflexivity so that researchers are cognizant of what ecosystem services research produces and potentially displaces, what sorts of understandings of the world may be lost in evaluating predefined ecosystem services. Second, we suggest that pre-imposing ecosystem services may generate results that respondents agree with, as we saw in our research, but that researchers should remain open to other possible modes of existence and human non-human entanglements that shape environmental behaviors and attitudes. And third, we suggest that research managers and others implementing the ecosystem services framework should treat ecosystem services as a situated practice. Building on Donna Haraway's work, uh, we explain that situated practices produce situated knowledge, a knowledge that is locatable, partial, and critical, and that can be held accountable for its findings. We suggest treating the identification and valuation of ecosystem services as something locally contingent and collaboratively identified. 
This may lead to resource management and interventions that better uphold the interests of the communities they are intended to benefit. And thank you all for listening and being here today and to everyone who supported this research. What are you are you screen sharing, Teresa? We're not seeing something. Oh, I didn't hear anything. Did oh, you? Oh, sorry. Ask? Yeah, I was turning over to you. Yeah. Do you want to screen oh. share? Oh yeah, no, I will. Sorry, I didn't hear yeah, anything. Okay. That's so weird, huh? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, can everyone see? I'm not seeing it yet. Does everybody else see it? There we go. There it is. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, present our work. So um, this uh, also a contribution in the special issue um, is based on work that uh, my master's student, Victoria Marini did um, in combination with an NSF project. So uh, the title of the paper is Place, Attaption, Place Attachment and Perceptions of Land Use Change cultural ecosystem services and eucalyptus plantation expansion in Ubahai and Rios, Argentina. So just a little background, sorry, I need to, uh, a little background. So, um, in, okay, there we go. Uh, in Argentina, uh, in the northeast, northeast coast of the Uruguay River of Entre Rios province, Land use change has resulted uh, due to the expansion of eucalyptus and pine plantations. And uh, land use change such as this, uh, you know, plantation expansion is occurring in many regions of the global south. Um, so just this is kind of one of the areas of highest concentration of expansion of monocultural forest plantations in Argentina. Um, so a little background, um, some of the previous literature looking at the impacts of plantation expansion. Um, a lot of negative environmental impacts have been documented, uh, effects on water resources, loss of soil organic carbon, acidification of soil, biodiversity decline. Uh, also many negative social impacts have been uh, documented, decrease in the quality of employment, declines in rural population and rural uh, employment, poor working conditions, et cetera. But uh, on the other hand, um, there have been a lot of uh, positives in terms of impacts um, on job creation. So the research questions that um, animated this study is how do residents sense of place explain their perceptions of environmental and socioeconomic impacts and ecosystem services related to fast growing tree plantations and how do sense of place and place meanings change over time in response to dramatic social and landscape change. Um, so just to give you a little brief background, um, there's quite a bit more detail in the paper, but um, you know, what do we mean by sense of place? Um, it's, there's quite a long literature, but just uh, briefly, when we talk about sense of place, we're talking about the meaning and importance of a setting held by an individual or a group based on the individual or group's experience in that setting. So we're looking at how is sense of place shaped and how does it affect perceptions of land use change uh, in this uh, landscape that has undergone very dramatic transformation over the last 30 or so years. Um, so briefly again, the study area, um, it has a very interesting history. Um, so Ubahai right there in the center is now the municipality, uh, which is where we uh, did, the, did the study, where we did interviews. 
Um, but prior, it uh, when this area was settled, it was settled um, in several colonies, which were um, composed of migrants from different European countries, particularly um, Germany, uh, and actually a lot of them were Jewish colonies. So it's a very interesting history. The, so the colonies have kind of been, uh, you know, absorbed essentially into what is now the municipality. Other important features uh, and places in the landscape um, is El Parmar National Park, which is uh, a local national park. And then you see also the Uruguay River. Um, so uh, as I said, this is one of the largest concentrations uh, of expansion of, of plantation forestry. This area also has a very large concentration of sawmills. Um, and so it was a great place to study some of these questions. Okay, so in terms of our research method and research design, um, we were very interested in actually interviewing people who had experienced the land use change during their lifetime. So we chose uh, adults uh, over 35 years old, and we had 14 men and eight, 14 women, sorry, and 18 men. Uh, and in Argentina, um, it's required to vote in presidential elections. So we actually use the voters list um, as our sampling frame um, and did a stratified random sample by age and gender. And then additionally did some snowball sampling for some additional key informants um, for the study. So the interviews were conducted face-to-face, -face, uh, open-ended in-depth questions all in Spanish in 2015. And they were focused around the reasons why places were considered important to uh, people, their, their perceptions of plantation and plantation impacts, uh, as well as some demographic questions. In addition, um, we also collected a lot of secondary data, reports, government documents, um, field notes, pictures, took GPS points and did um, participatory mapping where we were actually asking people to locate on paper maps, like where were their special places? And I'll get to that. So briefly, um, the results uh, focus on the mapping of important places to uh, residents, the reasons why these places are considered important, and then the association between their sense of place and their perceptions of landscape transformation. Um, so these dots you see on the right hand side, um, the, the dots uh, basically are the numbers of times that particular places were mentioned as important to uh, interviewees. So the, the place that was mentioned most often was uh, the current municipality of Ubahai. Um, in addition, uh, secondly was the El Palmar National Park. Um, and then thirdly, uh, the Uruguay River. Um, so just to give you a, a sense of how we kind of put the pieces together in terms of looking at place characteristics. So what were the, uh, the places, the physical attributes, attributes of places that were considered important, what people did there, as well as individual uh, characteristics. And, I mentioned um, the history of the colonies and that was actually very important in terms of the, the cultural histories and, and people's associations and attachments to different um, pieces or parts of the landscape. Um, a lot of people, I'm sorry, I didn't, we have so many quotes and if you read the paper, you'll get a much better sense, but um, I it, it just felt like it was too hard to pick. Um, so, but that was a very important issue for a lot of people was kind of the, the cultural history, the places they had gone to picnic with their grandparents, et cetera. Um, also really interesting in terms of the length of residence, how long they had lived in that place. Some of the interviewees had migrated there to work in the sawmills or to work um, in the forestry plantations. Some had been born there, some had not. And all of these things really factored into, and type of job, sorry, um, kind of their sense of place and therefore their perceptions of um, socioeconomic and environmental impacts of the eucalyptus plantations. And importantly, I mentioned um, at the outset that, um, you know, uh, it, what we found was that uh, people were making trade-offs, you know, even though they felt 
um, kind of nostalgia and they felt uh, a loss that the previous landscape had been transformed into a plantation landscape. They also uh, traded that off against the economic opportunities that were brought by the plantations and uh, you know, the forestry industry, especially compared to a lot of other rural towns nearby in Argentina that had just um, really experienced tremendous outmigration and rural decline. So they were making kind of a trade-off relative to other places. They felt they had lost um, some of you know, their memories, some of their landscapes they were attached to, but they also kind of um, offset that with some of the positives. So just to give you a sense, you know, based on, um, again, like place of origin. So the people who were, we call them native to the colonies, the people who were descendants who had come when they were colonies previous to the municipality. So they didn't see anything positive about the eucalyptus plantations. Um, and they saw a lot of negatives, you know, that their traditions and customs were lost. They noticed um, water scarcity, biodiversity loss. Uh, whereas people who were not natives to the municipality were more positive about jobs from plantations, but also noticed some of the same negatives, water scarcity, biodiversity loss, increase in fires by having plantations so close to uh, where people are living. However, those who were native to Ubahai, so were born in the municipality, um, they saw a lot of policy positives. They saw jobs from the plantations uh, and they thought that uh, actually having a lot of forests around them brought in increased air quality. Um, so I guess, you know, the, the point that we're trying to uh, make here is that it really depended on, you know, your occupation and where uh, your place of origin in terms of how people uh, perceived impacts, positive and negative impacts. So then conclusions and implications. Um, Sense of place is a multi-dimensional concept. Meanings are socially constructed. We found that length of residence, place of birth and type of job really uh, affected uh, sense of place and your perceptions of impacts, uh, as well as the importance of physical characteristics in developing sense of place. So the physical landscape characteristics that is um, importantly, sense of place is not a static phenomenon, but is really affected by landscape change. So people, um, you know, have a sense of place and now relate to what is their current landscape in a different way than the previous landscape. But, uh, you know, this sense of place is, is not static. Um, again, I've already said this, but perceptions of land, uh, impacts of land use change really vary according to the different senses of place. And finally, that perceptions are influenced by the economic context of Argentina. So as I mentioned, um, you know, folks were also cognizant that relative to other rural towns in Argentina, they were better off and they had a sense of pride about that. Um, so I just also want to acknowledge uh, that, uh, acknowledge all the residents of Ubahai for participating in this research. And it was uh, funded in part by an NSF award. Uh, and that's a picture of uh, Victoria Marini and myself in Ubahai. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you to all the panelists.